Jane Frazier is City's CEO. She joined the bank in 2004 in the Corporate and Investment Banking Division, and she's the first woman to be chief executive in the bank's history. Frazier manages what she calls the world's most global bank, serving millions of customers, businesses, and institutions across 160 countries. In this episode of Influencers, I'm joined by the city CEO as we discuss the future of digital currency, why she thinks Asia is the world's epicenter of wealth creation, and what city's clients are saying about the current bottlenecks in the supply chain. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Jane Frazier, City CEO. Jane, so nice to see you. Oh, wonderful to see you, Andy. Thank you so much for inviting me. Of course. So City just announced strong earnings with profits up about 48% year over year, driven in part by big returns in equity trading revenue and M&A. So much of a difference, though, during COVID when you're doing business. And there are some... Um, tailwinds that you have, actually. And I'm wondering how sustainable those numbers are as we're coming out of the pandemic. Yeah, look, I've had the advantage as we come out of the pandemic of getting on the road a lot recently. I've been in all, all sorts of places, Mexico, London, Germany, Kenya, uh, uh, all, all over, um, and getting a lot of color from the clients on the ground because there's nothing like engaging with them as well as with our investors. And what I'm hearing is a lot of confidence from the clients. They have a lot of liquidity on their balance sheets. They get it. They're feeling good about their, their, he their health of their um, financial health and therefore they're they're using this liquidity to drive capex they're using it to drive m a they're using it to drive growth a couple of geographies we're seeing some deleveraging not surprisingly in china being one of them um, but I think it's that together with the consumer savings, particularly in the States being so high, that you have these engines of growth, that despite some common concerns that we're hearing around, you know, supply chains and inflation and, and labor markets, um, which I'm sure we'll touch on. Um, but despite that, I think these are going to be important engines. So from our point of view, um, robust pipelines heading into the end of the year into next year and also you know for us as a very global bank a lot of work on strengthening supply chains um, for our clients around the world and both strategically as well as tactically and that's also quite an important growth driver for us so i'm feeling cautiously optimistic andy nice to hear that jane you touched on a number of things we want to get back to as you're saying supply chain and labor shortages and all that yeah. You took over as CEO in February, is that right? Uh, March the 1st, so yeah. March the 1st, right, okay. Um, and you've been busy, you've <laughs> undertaken a strategic refresh. Uh, so what areas of the business do you see as offering growth opportunities and what are you getting out of and what's driving those assessments? Yeah, yeah. Look at, I think as any any new CEO, you do take a fresh look at your strategy. And I think particularly relevant given how COVID has accelerated digitization in the industry. So competitive landscape looks different in the decade ahead, scale and scope um, and speed um, has also increased greatly. So with that, um, how do we change our business mix of the bank to make sure we're as well positioned as possible? I have a very important um, returns gap with some of my peers that is a very high priority to narrow, but also how do we run the bank better? Um, so the types of areas we've been looking at, we've done a very clinical review of the business. I think a number of different areas we're excited about. We are the world's most global bank. We move $4 trillion of volume daily. I mean, it's a mind boggling number. And it's in areas such as foreign exchange, cash management, trade, um, really the heart of the global flows in the economy. 
I see that just growing, continuing to grow in scale and speed. So a lot of the strategy is looking at how do we make sure that we're modernizing the whole bank to be ready for that. That affects talent, risk and control, that affects your tech platforms last mile. So quite a bit of a focus on, in, on the strategy, on the how. In terms of areas, I'm excited about Asia, I have to say. Um, and we'll, I'm, that one I know we'll go into deep dive in and I'm sure, but there's a lot of wealth creation happening there. Tremendous amount of innovation and the number of unicorns being created. So there are a number of waves to ride there. We're particularly excited in our commercial banking operations, um, in our wealth management businesses, as well as in the way that we connect different markets in Asia together and the intra-regional flows, as well as the flows around the world. So um, you know, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of areas to be excited there. I think it's true everywhere else around the world in those same areas, but I'd say it's that global flows, wealth, commercial banking are sort of the big growth areas for us, as well as retaining our leadership positions in the other businesses that we're, we're focused on. Well, let's drill down into Asia then a little bit. Yeah. Um, not a homogeneous region at all. No. Uh, and, and so I, I'm wondering, you know, sort of top down what your strategy is, say graphically A yeah. and then product B, sort of yeah. the matrix view. Well, I, I mean, I'd start off by saying we've taken a pretty hard look and very early on um, made the call actually to exit our consumer banking franchises in Asia. It's an, that's a part of the business that I think is very locally driven and that while we've had big strengths in that historically, I would rather focus our shareholders' money in the capital into the areas I think we have a competitive advantage. So we're exiting our retail franchises in Asia, and in um, monetizing that value, excess capital will go back to the shareholders. Then when I look at the, um, the Asia markets themselves, across the board, you're right, different geographies, you're seeing some differences, but I'd say it is the epicenter for wealth creation. We're seeing this in terms of a rapidly growing middle class, therefore we're focused on wealth. We're seeing this in half of the world's unicorns have been created in Asia. Um, so it's also driving our mid-market businesses as the, um, like, almost like an elevator, for clients in the mid-market, many are born digital, rapidly go become Asian players, not just their domestic players. And we're seeing the time frame from birth to IPO in Asia for most companies being six years, which is an astonishingly short period. Um, and then finally, what we are again seeing across the board is this digital acceleration. It's being powered by e-commerce, it's been powered by technology innovation. Um, and so um, you know, all of this activity that's occurring of transformation means um, for us and I think for our peers, wealth, being in this epicenter of that wealth creation, being in the epicenter of digital and technology innovation is really critical. And I, I'll give you an example. I was sitting down with the finance minister of India this weekend who, uh, last weekend, sorry, time flies here. Uh, she was in town for the IMF. And um, you know, we were talking about the fact that you know, city serves 50% of the unicorns in India. We serve about 30% of the multinational companies in India and how incredibly vibrant those markets are and how digital that has become in the last few years. So I think these trends are going to be the same no matter where you are. And we're also seeing the recovery from COVID starting to accelerate. I was pretty encouraged to see um, ourselves, we're starting to bring people back um, into our sites again um, after the second surge of COVID in India. And we're seeing it come, you know, beginning to uh, see a stronger recovery there after, after a pretty brutal few months in many, many geographies in Asia from a COVID perspective. I'm bullish as you can tell. I, I can tell. <laughs> let, me, let me follow up though and ask you about China specifically, mm. Jane. You set up a commercial banking desk in Singapore uh, yeah. to help emerging Chinese 
companies expand across Southeast Asia. But yeah. I'm wondering, you know, sort of understanding, judging, and then figuring out how to play China must be very yeah. complex. And I'm wondering what you're thinking is. Um, Yes and no. We've been in China, I think it's almost uh, just over 120 years. So we have seen China through many phases. We're on the ground there and you know, have, a, have a long history in the country. So that does help. Um, and we serve many of the multinational companies, helping them do business on the ground and many investors doing business on the ground there. Um, what I'd say about it is that clearly um, it's, it's undergoing material shifts as it has done and has taken some pretty impressive strategic shifts over the last decade. When you think of the pivot to more of a consumer oriented um, driver and more self-sufficiency of their growth as opposed to the dependency on export and infrastructure um, and, you know, that's obviously one that um, the government is pursuing quite aggressively right now. That does mean slower growth. And I think there's some concern about overheating in China right now. There's a focus on deleveraging for sure. Um, but as we look in the longer run, um, it's going to certainly be, you know, a major engine of growth for the world as it has been. But I think the um, it's come off the boil for sure. Um, but I think uh, you know bubbling away too too ferociously isn't great either. So uh, yeah, I mean we're looking at it with some caution in the immediate term. But in the um, you know the role China will play in the in the world is only going to increase in its importance, and one uh, we'll all have to manage carefully. You know that phrase you just said, Jane, come off the boil. I picked yep. up on that from the earnings call. You used yeah. that. Phrase. I don't know if that's a Scottishism, but it is. Um, it's a it's a love of cups of tea. Got it. And so it means <laughs> things are slowing down a bit, or there's some concerns, yeah. a little bit of headwinds. You just talked about China, but I want to ask you about some of the domestic and other global factors as well. Yeah. We talked about supply chain. We've talked about inflation, debt ceiling negotiations. Yeah. What's what's concern you the most? And Maybe, maybe we could talk about inflation because that concerns a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've stopped hearing people saying transition or transitory because it's feeling a tad longer than that. However, if we look at the causes of it, um, they are ones that the world economy will work through. I mean, we did have an extraordinary dislocation in COVID. Um, and I think pat on the back to the world economy about how incredibly it was responded to both in terms of the regulators from the, the support given to the markets down to um, you know, our clients around the world and indeed our people. Um, but it's going to take some time adjusting and we don't go back to the way it was. We're going to a new normal as well. And I think the strength of the recovery in the first half of the year everywhere around the world was better than anyone expected. But the result of that is demand was very, very strong. Um, strong from consumers, strong from corporates, and our supply chains therefore had some, has had some pretty severe dislocations from logistics all the way through consumer hoarding, all the way through higher consumer demand to other dislocations in this, in the both demand and supply of materials. This too shall pass. Um, it's going to pass probably in 2022, um, and we're probably in for a bit of a brutal winter, particularly in the energy markets, where there's also some challenges there. But it's not long-term structural stuff that we won't adjust to. I'm certainly more concerned that it could become more sustainable, because inflation is sustained. Um, it is unquestionable. I think the word someone used the other day that we're certainly having episodic inflation unquestionably. The question is therefore, does this become something more sustained? We won't know till next year. I, I, I don't think it will um, become a, a big issue, but it certainly is something that's going to be choppy for the next while, and it won't be helped if the US debt ceiling situation doesn't get resolved on a more timely basis before December. I want to ask you about uh, employment and yeah. specifically, and workers and working specifically at City. Um, two part question, Jane. One, back to work, how is that going? Um, 
two days a week, uh, vaccines and all that, number one. And then number two, are you having a hard time simply hiring people? Yeah, look, um, it, it, it certainly depends all around the world. So every market is a little bit different depending on vaccines, depending on um, what's happening in terms of health in the local geography. So sort of one size doesn't fit all in the, in the equation we're looking at. But what we are seeing is from the workforce, um, people don't want to go back to where they were. There's a feeling of they've changed, um, I've changed, and I want things to be a little bit differently, and we've shown some more flexibility does indeed work. Um, we do want people back. We do think there is tremendous value in being together. It's important for apprenticeship. We can see it with our kids. Anyone who's been doing homeschooling, it's just, it, you know, the kids learn more in school than they do in the home environment. They learn other things, important things at home, but it, it's just easier. I think it's the same way for, um, you know, in the work environment. We learn a lot from each other helps for coaching it helps for collaboration it helps for others but flexibility is also very important to our people and, and so for us it's a balance of the two that we want to give folk come back together but we're going to give you more flexibility than it was before and i would say that that um, seems to be working i know it worked for me when i was a working mother I needed that type of flexibility myself. Um, and I didn't feel that it needed to interfere with my effectiveness as a professional. So I think that that's how we're looking at it. I would say that's been successful for us in being a magnet and somewhere attractive for people to work. That said, right now, the labor supply is incredibly tight. Um, so when, when we're looking at our, we look at people who are working in an operations center, they've had, haven't had to commute, they haven't had the costs of that, um, they don't necessarily want to come in every single day and they've got the setup for a call center right at home. Um, and, you know, we can see whether they're being productive or not or need to come in for more efficiency. So I think, again, by mid next year, some of the supply, some of the labor supply will have worked its way through, but it's a very, very tight market at the moment. And it is one topic we talk about when I jump on the phone with our CEO clients, which we do all the time. We're no longer talking return to office, we're talking tight supply chain. And I think uh, it will be the first topic for a while longer. Yeah, retaining those employees. So. Yep. Yeah, yes. first retaining them, and then then after that, trying to hire. Um, yeah. Shifting shifting gears a little bit, Jane. I want to ask you about another huge topic, uh, and that is crypto yes. and decentralized finance. And I, and I guess I want to, you know, as a CEO, I can ask you sort of the big strategic question: How do you view this nascent, uh, yeah. incipient world that is obviously affecting your bank, and your business, and how do you plan and move forward? Um, a topic we, we spend a lot of time discussing with many of our partners and clients as well. So I think you start off with a premise. It's clear that digital assets will be in part of the financial services and financial markets, um, the future of them. Um, we already see clients very active in the space. Um, Real-time payments are both, both in the sense of they're frictionless, they'll become more global, they'll become ubiquitous. Real-time payments will be here in the near term. And digital currencies may be part of that future. Um, we see benefits from um, the digital asset space, instant processing, fractionalization, programmability, and transparency. You know, very geeky words for you know, geek like me, I love them. Um, but those are very tangible benefits that come from it. I would say we're proceeding thoughtfully and with appropriate caution here. Why is that? There's still a lot of questions about how the space evolves um, around regulatory um, clarity, around some of the scalability, around resiliency, certainly around some transparency, um, and making sure that there are the appropriate guardrails in the system, particularly for our retail clients. We don't want them participating in areas that you know, they're not necessarily as well equipped to understand the risks of. So 
Um, for me as a CEO, I'm working to connect our clients to wallets. We're enabling our businesses to and our, and our corporate clients to accept consumer payments. We're building the infrastructure for retail uh, real-time payments, but we're doing so cautiously um, because the space is moving so quickly and not all the guardrails that you would like to see are, are yet in place. And uh, you know, as a banking CEO, I do believe guardrails are important and necessary for the safe, safety and soundness of the financial system. Um, and so uh, I, li I like them there um, for resiliency. That provides a nice segue to my next okay. question, which is the regulatory environment and the relationship of city to Washington and the banking sector writ large to Washington. What would you like to see out of Washington, D.C. that would be most helpful, Jane? I think it's what we're talking about. You know, we're seeing this world move um, unbundling from the old financial architecture, and that's from currencies all the way down to deposits, and it's moving to new digital architectures. They're largely born digital, so outside of trading and some of the more institutional spaces, there's a real disconnect from one architecture to the other. It's not a, um, it's not an evolution, and therefore we've got to transfer the wisdom, the knowledge, how to make that system work well and safely and soundly from one architecture to a new one. And I think it's one in which our regulators are clearly very focused on this. Washington is very focused around this from the central banks around the world are. And I think it's that we continue a constructive and active dialogue between public and private, between the fintech and the uh, banking world to make sure that we have a system that will capture the benefits of these new technologies, but also one that will work um, in the way that's in every in the best interest for everybody and doesn't have um, recklessness in there. Um, and so far, a very constructive dialogue. I think we all need to be highly engaged and listening to everybody on this front. A couple of questions about ESG, Jane. Um, yep. First of all, you guys announced a billion dollars in strategic initiatives in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd last year to help mm -hmm. close the racial wealth gap. Can you talk about that, number one? And then number two, you guys have committed to phase out financing for coal power uh, yep. by 2030, although not with oil and gas. So can you, that's, that's a lot of stuff there, but can you <laughs> yes. um, each one of those, please? Yeah, and um, quite quickly on the on the racial equity. So in the US, we announced $1.25 billion really to support the closing of the racial um, equity and wealth gap. We've done some important work that showed in our research departments that you know if we if that gap was closed, the US economy would be five trillion dollars bigger. I mean, that's a benefit that lifts everybody up. This is, this is a win-win for everyone of work on this. Um, we've actually, we put a three-year commitment in, we're about a year and a half through and we've almost completed it. So um, we will be re-upping um, the number before long. And it's focused on areas such as affordable housing, supporting black entrepreneurs that haven't had the access to capital, um, working with our um, MDI and CDFI partners. So this is minority owned banks um, in accessing some of the communities that we don't have a presence in and providing access to credit um, and uh, in ways where we're also partnering. So just very important pieces that we've been working on that lifts, lifts everyone up. I think similarly, when we look at our commitments around climate, I, you know, when I look at what we need to do, it's very clear that we need to help the economy shift onto new technologies and onto greener technologies. That said, I'm very mindful that we also have an energy policy that's important in the play here. And getting that balance of making sure that we shift onto and help prove out new technologies, we develop them, we get the cost of these to come down, 
We've seen wind and solar come down dramatically over the last few years. Um, you know, these are all very important dialogues that we're having with our clients. So um, we don't want to jeopardize energy policy, particularly in emerging markets or in the developed world. But at the same time, we want to help our clients shift onto these new technologies and onto cleaner technologies and help them responsibly retire the, um, the other assets. So we separate out coal um, from gas, from oil, and, we make, and uh, we've made the commitment on coal. I've made the commitment for our firm of net zero by 2050. Um, and we're working very actively on all the fronts, on disclosures, on understanding climate risk, on understanding energy policy um, and the needs of the world, and looking at how we can make this shift happen in a responsible man manner, but make it happen. It's not an easy balance, um, but uh, we think it's an important one. On March 1st this year, when you became CEO, yeah. you were the first woman who was the CEO of a major investment bank in the US. And is that something that still informs you or that you consider, or is that sort of in the rear view mirror at this point, Jane? Um, I think, as, as, uh, as I'm sure our investors would expect of me, I'm much more focused now on doing a good job in the day job and being a good CEO than thinking about being, uh, you know, a female CEO. So it, it doesn't it doesn't really affect the day to day. I'm certainly mindful, um, particularly when I speak to many of our um, you know male investors and and male clients who are dads. Um, that actually this was something that was important for daughters around the world. It's something I'd expect the mums to talk about, um, but many of the dads have. So there's certainly a sense of responsibility there, um, but in a positive way. Um, and I know it was obviously a, a proud moment, but I didn't think of it as much on the, the gender front. It kind of came as a bit of a surprise how much it was there. Does it affect how I am as a leader? I, I think there are advantages to being a female leader right now in the sense of I, I'm probably much more comfortable leading in a different style. I almost feel that if you're if some of my male colleagues, they're almost more in a, an expectation around how they'll do something, whereas I feel as if I have more liberty and freedoms around that. And that's particularly leading with empathy right now. I think of empathy as a competitive advantage. Empathy is about listening and understanding another person's point of view and incorporating it. I've grown up in the client business here and I've found that to be a very valuable skill when working with clients. So you're not pushing my idea or product on them, actually understanding what they want. I think it's the same, particularly for our people. You know, what is it our, our, our employees and our people are needing right now? So how do we get that balance right to be competitive in the talent market? Uh, I think is very helpful. And I think people are after a sense of purpose again, a sense of identity of the bank that they belong to. And they want to be in a bank with brains, but they also like the idea of a bank with, um, with some soul and purpose about it as well. And we talk about that, but make no mistake, empathy, we believe, gives us excellence and an edge. Um, it's not just there because it's a nice to have. It's there because we do believe it provides us competitive advantage. And it's it's very deliberate um, around that. And quick last question, Jane, what is it like to be back out on the road, meeting with customers and employees? Oh, I think in a word, energizing. Um, particularly if you're you know, new in the CEO role, um, it, Zoom's been great for being able to get to people, but there's nothing like building relationships in person and actually wandering the floors um, and talking to people, seeing how they're doing uh, and building that personal connectivity. So I have to say it, it's certainly informing me. Um, I'm listening hard and, uh, you know, I'm hearing a lot from our investors about what they're expecting from the bank, what they're expecting from me. And, um, you know, it's easier to have very frank conversations in person. And um, I'm, I'm loving it. It's very, very helpful. Great. Well, I hope to see you in person yeah. someday soon as well. Jane Fraser, City CEO, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Andy, for having me.